Are there any parents of teenagers in here? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I really thank you for coming. Um, I believe the youth in this culture hold the shadow. Um, we project a lot of stuff onto it. It's the one time of life that seems to be either demonized or exalted. Um, I mean, everybody's adolescent years are either the worst years of their lives or the best years of their lives. Um, and as opposed to just another developmental <coughs> stage. Um, and teens are different from adults and we expect them to act as adults sometimes and then we get really surprised when they don't. Um, and their brains are very different. They're going through very, very different stages. Hi. Um, and working with teens and their family and therapists in training, um, it, it, it's just come up consistently that it's hard for us to remember because our brains are different what it was like when we were teenagers. It's kind of easier to remember when we were kids to really remember the experience because it was very different. It was in this in-between state. Um, and to start to address our shadow um, I think we need to start to remember. That's the first part. And I don't expect us to get really deep tonight because we don't know each other and we're on tape and uh, we only have an hour. Uh, but I would like us to do a little remembering. And first of all, what is it about teenagers, either your own or teenagers you know or teenagers in general that bugs you? <laughs> what are some of the things that really bug, that really annoy you? When they respond with I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> I don't know. If they just want to go. Repeating things three times and then being told that I never told them something. Uh huh. I've recently learned that my um, my perfect adolescent has been protecting me and withholding the truth. Gee, what a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and did you ever do that when you were a teenager? Mm -hmm. Oh, never, no. Okay. Anything else? Oh, I bet eye rolling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that usually gets us pretty good. And the whatever is, um, whatever is a really good way of just saying you. Yeah. Um, whatever. Yeah. Um, but they have a lot going on. They have an awful lot going on. Um, and sometimes I think you can repeat things three times even. They might repeat it, and they really don't hear it. Mm -hmm. They have so much else going on that what we say is kind of irrelevant sometimes. Um, so what I'd like us to do tonight is do a couple of short guided imagery exercises um, just to help us remember a little in the different aspects. So we're like, all right, chill. <laughs> Joel was at uh, Holden High too. Um, if so we're going to start with just doing a little guided imagery, and um, when we it'll be short, and you have a worksheet on which you can take notes. It can be basically four little exercises, um, and and so if just don't please don't try to write a book because we don't have that much time. But if you need to jot down one or two notes, and then anything that people are willing to share, that would be great, because we'll help each other remember if we talk, and in terms of issues that come up around your own kids or kids that you work with, um, looking at the shadow, you can at least start to look at the shadow a little bit, um, and, and we can help each other in that, because it's a scary thing to do. So, uh, for the first part, if you could just take a couple of breaths. Just get centered in yourself, comfortable, back straight but relaxed. Um, some people like their eyes closed, some people like them halfway. Okay. Now, remember walking down the hall in your high school. You're walking down the hall. What do you see? Who do you see? What does the hall look like? Are there posters? Are there lockers? Is there a flurry of movement? What do you smell? 
Is there people's cologne? Did the gym class just get out? Are there cafeteria smells? So just self be aware of that. What did you hear? Are people talking? Is it really noisy? People whispering? Is there music? Are there announcements going on? And what do you feel? Is it cold? Is it warm? What do your clothes feel like on your body? Are you wearing your favorite jeans, new pair of shoes at pinch? What's it feel like to be in your body? To have a body? A body that's probably changed recently. If you had a growth spurt, different parts of you grown or changed, you have face hair. What's it like? What's it feel like to be in a body, in a teenage body? Okay. okay, we're gonna have a slight change of scene, so take a breath to let the scene change. Okay, you're in your safest place. It may not be very safe, but it's the safest place you have as a teenager. Maybe your room, maybe under a tree, Maybe the library, maybe a music store, anywhere. Maybe on your bike. Okay, let yourself be there in your safest place. And what's your body feel like now? Can you notice any difference? Is it maybe a little more relaxed than when you're walking down the hall? in this safe place, ask your teenage self to tell you something that you should, that you can remember as an adult right now about being in a teenage body. What is it, the message from your teenage self about being in a body? That may be, you may get words for that, you may get an image, you may get a sensation. Okay, when you have that, take a breath. Body's right here in this room at CIAS. You can bring that safest place with you though. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Hi. say a word or two about what came up for them or what was easy or hard about the exercise if you don't want to speak particularly about what came up for you. <coughs> said the phrase walking down the hall in your high school I immediately got this feeling like I might cry uh -huh. I think I just felt really unsafe and kind of on my own when I was in high school yeah yeah the thought that I wanted to convey to my adult self was I'm so bored I don't have my purpose yet uh -huh. I don't know what I'm here for and it's like this angst and pain about kind of not knowing what to do with all my energy and creativity and life. Yeah. It's really sad. Yeah. But it's com but that's coming up. Yeah. Which we'll also get to in a few minutes. 
Um, but it's, there is all this energy. There's this incredible physical energy. Your brain has just gone through this growth spurt and it's starting to prune. So you're learning all these new things. Um, and you have all the hormones going on at the same time. It's, it's a very intense cellular time for us. Um, would anyone else like to say anything about that, what that was like? Yeah. Uh, you, you asked about that, how you feel inside. It's a, it's a useful illusion. <coughs> My thing was is that I had always had a million questions. Uh -huh. And I, I grew up in a, both in a family and a society that didn't tolerate any questions. And uh, I struggled through many, many years. How many of you were judged as being rebellious or defiant um, or oppositional? How many of you were? <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, purposely? Were you purposely being oppositional and defiant? Were you trying to be oppositional and defiant? No, it had more to do with exerting our own preferences and desires as yes. resisting having things uh, imposed that didn't fit. Yeah. Um, for me, it was really the opposite. I remember feeling really scared and <laughs> Wanting things to be different than they were. Yeah. Yeah. That's the motivation for me. Yeah. I have a question. Is it possible to go to actually not go through adolescence until? So I don't feel like I actually went through kind of differentiating at all mm -hmm. until I was I went to college, mm -hmm. and I. My college experience was such a classic like, adolescent, all those intense, intensifying emotions and rebellion, all those things happened, started when I was 19. You're still an adolescent. I mean, <laughs> brain-wise, you're still an adolescent until mm -hmm. mid-20s. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Um, and, I mean, people mature at different rates, and also we grow in ways that's safe to grow. We're not going to grow in ways that aren't really safe. We may, you know, get ourselves in a lot of trouble, but we're still usually not going to do something that's emotionally dangerous for us. So if the situation isn't safe, we're usually not going to go there. It's, we're just not. Um, also, um, a lot of teenagers experiment, experiment or use substances, um, and the general research is that if you use a lot, your emotional growth kind of stops. And then, you know, so if you use a lot for years, then you have to pick up where you left off. Um, but that can also be true if there's, I mean, th if there's trauma, I mean, most of us have experienced some kind of trauma. Um, at some point, we're humans, um, some worse than others. But it's, that also affects how you're going to re respond and what's going to happen. So there's a lot of situations that, that make it different. But I think that the imposition on imposing values, um, we're trying to, as teens, we're trying to identify who we are. What do we believe? Not what culture believes. What do we believe? Who are we? And how do you do that? You can't just say, oh, I believe this. I don't believe that, I don't believe that, I don't believe this, and this really sucks. So no, I don't believe any of that. I'm not quite sure what I believe yet, but I know what I don't. Okay? Yeah. I, I got in touch with that. Um, I did it in terms of... And the adult view of the world is very different than your teenage view of the, of the world. Um, Jeannie, one of our old colleagues, once said that um, teenagers were the conscience of the culture. 
because they can see what's wrong. And as adults, we forget. We're not there anymore. They may not know what's right yet, but they can tell you what's wrong. And that's really important because when, when what happens between adolescence and adulthood, when, I mean, granted we have practical things we have to do, like, you know, get it, learn more, get a job, support a family, but where does that passion go? You know, where does that, this is wrong, go? I mean, probably we don't have as much time for it, but it's still, where is that, you know? You said something a few minutes ago that we don't go where it's not safe. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? Emotionally, um, emotionally, we are going to, it's our nature as humans to grow, to learn. I mean, that's, that's what we do. Um, and if you look at little kids who haven't been traumatized, <coughs> their emotions are, ah! Right? Or, ah! And then it's gone. It's emotion. It's outward movement. So you have an emotion. It comes up. It gets expressed. And then it's gone. Um, unless it gets stifled. And we have to learn how to stifle some of them. Otherwise, we couldn't, you know, get food, basically. Um, we have to learn how to get along with other people and how to be able to put them aside until later. Um, but generally, I really believe that whatever we're doing emotionally is moving towards growth and healing. It may not be in our best interest in the way we're doing it, but we're doing it in the safest way we know how. If we have wounds, if we have parts of ourselves that have been suppressed, we're going to we're going to try to heal them. We're going to bring them out in the way that feels safe. Now that may not be very sensible intellectually, but it's, it's emotional. It's not logical. So emotionally it makes sense. We're going to go where it's safe and we're not going to go where it doesn't feel safe. Even though it may be safe in the moment, if we don't feel that it's safe because of past experience, we're not going to go there. So you know, the parts of, go ahead. When you were speaking about that, I was curious also, it was on the subject of not differentiating until after leaving home and going to college. Uh -huh. And I also felt confused about what would that kind of scenario be, what, how would it not be safe to differentiate? Um, if you do not get the support for differentiating, that you need, well, I mean, whether that's intentional, I mean, we're all humans, we all mess up, we all have stuff that, issues, we all have issues, some big, some small, we all have them. Um, and if for some reason, due to our human fo foibles or the course of events in life, um, it's not safe for you to become more of who you are, um, if that's threatening to the family in any way, like if maybe if you're in a family where it's not okay to be different from how your family is, then you don't do that until it's safe, which is later. Um, I think a lot of times um, people who've experienced abuse in the home, um, trying to deal with that as a teenager is impossible. You wait till you're out of the home, you wait till you're in, you're in your late 20s, you have a couple of years of independence and saying, oh my God, I can survive, I'm okay. I mean, I may, I may be a total mess, but I, you know, I'm here, I'm still here, I have these other supports. Um, and, and then that can happen. But again, if it's not safe, you're not gonna do it. Um, if, if you're in a situation where that is fostered, we're becoming independent and exploring your own self, even if the values are a little different, um, then you're probably going to go for that because it's safe. It's emotionally safe. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. We have one more. Um, <coughs> breath. Now in addition to the physical, the emotional, and the mental worlds, there's also a whole world of creativity 
and spirit that starts opening up in our adolescence. Our brains are making new connections and all these new relationships internally and with something larger are possible. What was your art? See yourself doing your art. It may be a typical art. It may be you know, a visual art. It may be a verbal art or written art. It may be a physical art, dancing, sports, skateboarding. Um, it may be cooking, anything. What is it that you are passionate about and creative about? Where do you get in touch with your muse? Where do you lose yourself? You may not have much opportunity to do this, but there's somewhere, it may be something you did when you were little, it may not be, it may be something totally new. It may be in relationship. You may find an art in relationship. Where is that bigger connection? Let yourself feel that. And if you really don't, can't find that anywhere, let yourself feel the longing for that. That longing for union. It may be in the way that you make mixtapes or playlists nowadays, I guess. Um, Maybe you don't think that you're creating something directly, but it may be in the way that you put things together. And you know what that feels like when you do it. And that union with something bigger. There may also be other places where that is in your life. You may get that in religion. You may get that in spirituality. You may get that in love. Where you unite with something much larger than your personality. And where is that now? How is that translated now? And what does your teenage self have to tell you about this fire, this passion, this union with something bigger about what you need to do in your life right now to get that? When you're ready, take a breath. So what came up for people? What, were, what was people's art? So that's what kept What else came up for people? Yeah. So it was interesting that how I... That's great. I'm curious about that my son and his friend make up these wacky sentences, you know, with like apparently unrelated nouns in them. And where is that coming from? Is it just, is it playing? I mean, I understand it is a creative thing, but why does that impulse come up in adolescence? Our brains are growing. <laughs> Intellectually, we're growing. We're trying to find connections. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're looking for connections because our brains are needing to prune. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that mean, needing to prune? Um, you get all this growth 
Okay, and then you have um, there's the the neurites have the neurons have um, a myelin sheath, which is kind of um, it helps the electricity conduct faster, um, and it prunes. And some of those some of the connections, some of those things die. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, um, like in language ac language acquisition, if you don't learn a language um, before you're about eight you can't ever get the accent totally right mm -hmm. because those pathways shut down. Shut down. Mm -hmm. they, they, they atrophy, they die. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're a teenager, there's all these potential things to learn and so you have to try all of them. And it's, um, yeah, so intellectually you're trying, to, you're trying to get concepts and like, well, what is the connection between I don't know, a fried egg and a radio. You know, there has to be some connection. You know, so you play. Mm -hmm. and, and that helps you learn. I mean, it's intellectual play is kind of like kids playing. Little kids playing mm -hmm. make-believe. You know? So. What, yeah? I just want to say I don't know how. Um, what else? Any other things that you guys would like to share about this part, the creative, spiritual part? Yeah. Um. Personality. I mean, that's what art does, is it gets you out of or beyond your personality, right? It's your, you focusing on you like that stops when you're really in the creative process. You become one with that. Um, that's why we have muses. I mean, you know, the creative gods have been around because it's more than just us that's doing creating. Um, and some people get, can access that through art. Some people can access it through religion and ritual. Um, some people access it, again, through love. When I was a teenager, I called my boyfriend God because I had never had this experience of unity before. I mean, it was, it was like union with the universe, you know. I mean, um, there are other ways to do that too, but there, there's where you let, where you give over, um, and I think substances also have that allure because we all want to give over to something bigger than just our little personalities, um, and drugs can lead us to that. It can keep you there. Um, I mean, Alan Watts stopped doing psychedelics because it's like, well, I come down every time, right? <laughs> Um, so he started doing Buddhism. Um, he still hasn't found a way to stay high all the time, but it, you know, it, it, it works more for him. Um, but yeah, there is this search for union for some, with something bigger than ourselves, and some people find that in a cause, which are also always big with teenagers, um, some teenagers. Um, it may be a very small cause, but it's a really intense cause. Okay. Um, and again, that's partly defining what I do believe in. When you find something you believe in as a teenager, you go for it. If you get any support for it, you go for it. Sometimes even if you don't get support for it, you're going to go for it. Um, and it may not be the thing that we all think is a good thing for teenagers to go for, but they're going to go for it anyway. If that's where, if that's where they can find something that they feel fulfilling um, and is safe. One more little one. Just one more. This is a very small one. So go back to your safe place, safest place with your inner teenager, your inner adolescence. Remember, remember, remember. And ask your teenage self from all of this from tonight, what is the one thing what is one thing that your adolescent self wants you to remember? And what is one little thing that you can do tomorrow? A little thing, an action. Just one little thing. Nothing fancy, nothing big. Just one little thing to do to help honor this aspect of you. 
to help integrate this part of you that some of this may have been lost because you grew up. And it's still there, waiting. And when you're ready, write that one thing down. If you write nothing else down tonight, write that one thing down that you're gonna do. listen to some Keith Richards when I get home actually. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> so that's music. That was that well actually Keith wasn't by himself back then, but that helped keep me alive. Yeah. So what are some things that people are gonna do? Write a poem. Write a poem. What else? I remember thinking I would always remember what it was like. Uh huh. Yeah. To be young, because all of these old people didn't want to remember, didn't yeah. care. Remember. And you knew they knew because they had. Yeah. And did you? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I was looking at the window. It was Roy Cloud School, and you could see. Mom. And had an adult say to them, "Oh, you're going to think about this differently when you grow up," <coughs> or "Oh, just when you grow up," mm -hmm. or "Oh, you'll grow out of it." Um, just grow up. Oh, it's only puppy love. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. Um, yeah, like this means nothing, right? Um, we do. We think differently. We have to remember. And especially when you're working with teenagers, it's going to come up. Everything that you don't remember is going to come up. And since you're not remembering it, it's going to come up unconsciously. Um, and you better be ready to work it because it will come up. Um, I, mean, I work with counselors mostly at the high school and people are literally going back to high school, right? Right. <laughs> You're literally going back. There's no escaping it. It's like, oh my God, are they gonna like me? Oh my God, what if nobody takes my groups? Oh, I mean, I still get that a little. You know, I've been doing this 30 years and it's like, okay, Rini, it's, yeah. You know, they're not all gonna like you. Um, but there's still that, ah. Uh, so it's still there, and there's still, it's like, okay, I really wanna connect. That's what that's about. And I would like to stop judging myself. Those are the two things. It's like, okay, I'm judging myself, and I'm feeling like people are judging me, and what I really want is to connect, is to drop my self-consciousness and connect with people. That's where you can get to, and that's where we weren't able to get to, or I wasn't able to get to when I was a teenager. So there's an awful lot that we can learn about ourselves and about being comfortable with ourselves and about being creative and being passionate um, and being thoughtful and thinking about new things in new ways and not trying to impose our agenda on other people. Other than safety issues, of course, service. <laughs> um, but it's like, this is what I think. This is, what do you think? What's going on for you? And it's really hard to do that. Pretty much every adult in kids' lives has an agenda. We either want to make sure they grow up, to, that they're happy and healthy, that they learn stuff, that they can get a job, that they're being responsible. Um, somebody has to be there to witness, to support their experience, and trust that they know what they need. They just need to get access to that. Because they do. They've had enough experience in life. They've had support. Maybe they need some more support, but they need support in accessing their own strengths. Because they know. They know. And if you give them a chance, they'll tell you that they know, and you don't. 
So listen, listen to them. And remember. So questions? We're about out of time. About 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. This is, uh, I'm not sure if this is appropriate, but I wonder if you might just talk something about the, sort of the whole sort of um, occupation of being a counselor in a school. And, I, and I'm totally new to the school and looking ahead and thinking, you know, what kind of work am I going to do? Uh -huh. And I just wanted to hear more about that. Our okay. school is different than most schools. Um, we have all the kids have one-on-one -on -one counseling every week. Wow. Yeah. And as well as access to groups, and we offer um, family, limited, but family sessions, um, as well as all the academic stuff, and behavioral stuff. Um, so it's integrated into the program. Um, I think a lot of other times you're going to end up where you get kids coming because there are behavioral issues, and you're supposed to address them. Um, but even then, the kids need you to be their witness. They need you to um, honor their experience and believe them, um, but at least believe their experience, even if you may not be able to believe what they're saying, um, and, and believe that they know what they need and they know what's safe, and if you can help them create a little more safety, that they can maybe go there. So do most schools have people like that? Are they being cut or what? I don't know that. I mean, has, didn't everybody have one teacher that did that mm -hmm. somewhere? One teacher who saw you for who you were, mm -hmm. allowed you to be who you were? Mm -hmm. um, I know most public schools, the counseling, I mean, there's like one counselor for like every 100 or 200 kids. If there's that now, it may be way less. Mm -hmm. So. But wasn't it that one relationship with your teacher who got you through school? It was one adult who, even though they may have graded you, they didn't, you know, they really saw you. There was a nurse. There used to be a nurse. You would see a nurse once in a while. They'd look you in the eye, they'd weigh you, they'd measure you, and they'd mm -hmm. speak to you, and then you'd see them again in a couple of weeks, maybe. But they don't have that. Yeah. It was long ago. But more and more schools are integrating, um, well, like CIS has a um, in-school counseling component for a lot of folks, which is awesome because teenagers can really flourish with somebody there to really honor them. An adult who doesn't have an agenda, who's there to help, if they want help, you can help to help them, but to honor them and give them that experience of the fact that they are valuable. They are useful, they are wonderful in who they are without changing anything. Because then they can change. Because they don't have to say, no, I'm not that. You know? Yeah. In working with uh, adolescents, like 13 to 15 year olds, I find sometimes often it's, I don't know, How do you usually work with that? Um, I don't sit facing them for one thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, oh, okay, that's okay. Or you just wait. A lot of times it'll be, uh, I don't know, or no. <laughs> and, okay. And it's like, it's okay that I just said no. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> but I mean, I've had kids who just naturally will just say no. And then they'll do whatever you're asking them mm -hmm. to do, or they'll answer whatever you're saying, as long as they can say no first. Um, <laughs> and sometimes building trust takes a long time. You have kids who do not trust adults. It can take, you know, most of the year to develop rapport. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you just can. Um, and activities are usually helpful. Um, doing therapy with teenagers is way different than with adults or with children. It's somewhere in the middle. So it's kind of like talking play therapy. I mean, um, so there is that intellectual. Uh, you may learn an incredible amount about a certain video game um, or about my, mountain bikes, okay? Let them teach you. Um, 
if they if you let them teach you, they may trust you. My 15-year-old has asked me on numerous occasions to let him teach me his yeah. video game. Yeah. I don't want to know. <laughs> but, so I'm really but you want to play with him. But I'm really interested to hear you say this thing. Because you <laughs> want to play with him. You don't yeah. want to play the game. Right. But you do want to play with him. Yeah. Didn't you love yeah. playing with him when he was a kid? Yeah. He just wants to play with his mommy. Thank mm. you. <laughs> okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, um, I think one of the things too is that where the shadow issues come up for a lot of therapists is when you're doing family work. Um, because you may have some unresolved, I mean we didn't even get to really family stuff in, the, in this at all. Um, but you may have some unresolved family issues of your own. Um, and that can come up in the therapy session for you. And hopefully it doesn't come up for the family. It just comes <laughs> up for you and you can deal with that later. <laughs> So, but notice it. I mean, notice when you're having a gut response. Um, do you, there, there's something there for you to learn. And notice when you're reacting, as opposed to being curious and figuring out what's, oh, oh, look at what's going on. It's like, wait a minute. It's like, okay, if, if it's not a safety issue, like, what is going on here? Yeah. And, you know, most often, 99.9%, they come out with these gems. Yeah. It's like, well, you know what's going on. Yeah. And they can spot BS like that. If you are not being authentic, they are going to let you know. They may let you know by going and walking away. Um, they may tell you you're full of crap. You know? um, but they're going to let you know one way or the other. Um, if you're not being authentic. So they teach us to be authentic much more than adults do because they just won't put up with it. They're, they'll either totally close off or they'll tell you, you know, which is really good. We need more of that in this world. And they're, they're wonderful. I mean, I still don't, the culture puts all of these horrible labels on them. They get to hold all of, you know, oh, you're just a teenager. Oh, it's just a phase. Oh, you'll grow out of it. Well, why should we grow out of asking what is the meaning of life and why am I here? When we stop asking that, then we're stuck. When we stop asking what is the purpose of this, we're in a rut. But that's my belief anyway. Um, you know, what is the purpose? Why am I here? What do I have to offer? What what is there to learn? These are these are important for the species, I think. So, and the kids remind us of that, and we're going, no, no, we're too busy. Um, but, mm -hmm. Um, I have some evaluation forms if anybody would be willing to fill out um, so I can help do this better.